I'm Dr. Robert Carter, and I'm sitting here in the studio once again with my good friend, Joel Tay. We are continuing our conversation on how God designed species to change. change. Yes. In the first part of this video series, we talked about three myths associated with the creation account of Genesis. Uh, Joel really thought of these, and he wrote them down, and we had this nice discussion on it. Joel, what mm -hmm. were those three myths? Well, the first one is this idea that God created all species as they are today. In other words, they did not change. Yeah, the fixity of species is, is the yes, old term. That's right. We certainly don't believe that, and the Bible does not teach that. Yes. What's the second one? Second one is that this idea that all species remain in the same location that they were since they were created. And that's an idea that really people don't believe anymore. Yes, Back right. in 1800s, it was a big deal that God created centers of diversity and you know different bear species on different continents were yes. created on those continents, which of course is not biblical because those bears had to come off the ark and then walk across the earth. That's right. What was the third one? So Rob, the third misconception is this idea that God only created two of every living creature. Oh, that's huge. It's huge because that changes everything. Because we know he created two humans. Yes, that's right. But what about oak trees? That's right. What about right. earthworms, copepods yeah. in the ocean? I mean, I, I assume that God created in some kinds, billions of individuals, E. coli yes, and whatnot. Right. So we're not limited to two at all. And that changes everything because people have this idea that creation is, you don't have much diversity and evolution is, they have lots of diversity. Yeah, but it's the opposite. It's the opposite because evolution believes in common ancestry of all things. So all things have to start off with a very small group of individuals that then diversify into the That's modern right. ones, yeah. But um, God could have created, created many animals from each created kind in yeah. the beginning. Yeah, so, and as we'll talk about later, mm -hmm. even if he only created two humans, that's plenty of potential genetic diversity to explain all the humans alive today easily. But yes. we'll get to that later. <laughs> all right. So those are the three things that we covered in part one, the last okay. time we were talking together. So and we are now, going to cover um, many more things about how we can explain the great diversity that we see in our DNA and genome. And we've been writing about this literally for decades. I mean, Carl Whelan, the founder of Creation Magazine, way back in 1991, yes, that's right. wrote an article about front-loaded uh, genomes, essentially, that the idea that God put into his creation, the ability to adapt and change over time. Yeah, so this is very much a creation model. Very much so. Yeah. For what, 91, 2000, 30 more years now. I mean, this That's is right. well within uh, the creation model. That's the right. idea that species change. And yet it still surprises people yeah. to hear it. Yeah. Mainly because a lot of the trolls on the internet <laughs> want to trip people up. It's like, oh, you believe in change, therefore you believe in evolution, which of course is false, but mm -hmm. that's the way the conversation usually goes. Okay, so we're talking about front-loaded genomes that is God creating um, our DNA with the ability to diversify and with lots of variation in there. Yeah, on purpose. On purpose, right. Okay. More recently, Dr. Pierre Turborg wrote an excellent article in our Journal of Creation, and he used a very complicated phrase. Yes. Pluripotent baronomes. Ooh, what on <laughs> earth? All right, what's pluripotent mean? A pluripotent is this idea that a cell can differentiate, it can change to many different things. So when we're talking about cloning and stem cells, stem cells, a yes. pluripotent cell can turn into any other cell type in the body. That's right. So yeah, like you mentioned, so pluripotent okay. stem cell, by changing the conditions it grows, can become any other cell in our okay. body. Okay. So pluripotent baronome. Yes, that's uh, another big Well, bara word. is the Hebrew word for create. Yes. And I think gnome is a play on words as in genome. Yes, genome. Yep. So it's, it's a created genome, but not in one individual, within all the individuals in a kind. So in the sense, when we talk about a, a baronome, for example, we can talk about the cat baronome, which include the cats, the tigers, the lions, all of that genetic diversity in the created kind is a baronome. So we have a pluripotent baronome. In other words, it's a genetic system spread out amongst multiple individuals with the capacity to change over time. Mm -hmm. The difference here is a created system. God deliberately created it so that his species would morph. They could adjust to new environments or just new features could just pop out of nowhere just for the created love of it. Yes. Okay. So, so Rob, you mentioned in your writings that this created baronome has a tolerance code. What's that? As long as you don't exceed the design specifications, that individual organism can survive. 
So when God, the ultimate engineer, created life, mm -hmm. he created it morphable and adaptable within boundaries. Okay. So like an aardvark can't suddenly lose its legs. Can't lose its legs? No, because it won't be able to live. It won't be able to walk. It won't be able to find food. It would die. It would have exceeded its design specifications. Mm -hmm. But it could change color. Mm -hmm. It could grow a little bit longer, a little bit smaller, maybe grow a longer snout, a longer tongue. All the, you know, just little slight changes, piece of cake, no big deal, easy to account for in the creation model. Mm -hmm. But there are limits to the amount uh, that you can change something before you break it. And that's the difference. So Rob, how did God front load you know, each created kind to diversify? You know, I discussed this in my article. There are a lot of different ways. Uh -huh. The easiest one to understand is just genetic diversity. What, what do you mean by that? He, he put a lot of genetic variation, or he could have put a lot of genetic variation into one particular created kind. Mm -hmm. And some of that variation could be hidden. What do you mean? I mean, how, how can it be hidden? Well, imagine that, um, well, let's go back to the, the example of Jacob breeding the streaked and speckled dark sheep from an all-white flock. That white flock was hiding phenotypes. It was hiding all those dark colors. And you don't see them because the dark colors in sheep, strangely, are recessive. Uh -huh. So even though all the sheep are white, well, there's dark hiding in the genes of the flock. Yes. And so as reproduction is happening, sometimes an individual sheep inherits both copies of the dark gene and all of a sudden it doesn't look white anymore. Okay, so it's a recessive gene issue here. Yeah, recessive gene. And imagine that there's a recessive gene at a very low frequency. Okay, within a created kind. Within a, a created kind. Yes. And maybe a thousand years later, all of a sudden a black sheep pops out. Where'd that come from? Well, it was there, but when God created it, he created that gene only in one or two individuals. It took a long time before one of them popped up with two copies of that gene, and all of a sudden you have a brand new phenotype. And that's what we call heterozygosity. The two different copies of the DNA. Yes, the but the, for the dark one, you had to be homozygous. You have to have two copies of the same gene. I see. And that could be happening all over the place in any number of different created kinds. You can get all sorts of change, I mean, size change, color change, behavioral changes, just because God hid initially recessive genes and you would never see them maybe for a long, long, long time. So this idea of um, heterozygous alleles brings us to our next point, recombination. So ah, recombination. That? It's another way to generate brand new phenotypes that were not even in existence. God didn't have to create them at all. He mm -hmm. could allow for them to form later. So the example that I gave in the article, I said, imagine we have some dogs. Yes. And there are two genes. One gene affects height and the other gene affects muscularity. Yes. And let's say that God initially created chromosomes that either had the tall and muscular genes uh -huh. or the short and thin genes. Mm-hmm. So there weren't any combinations of either tall and muscular or short and thin. So you had something like a mastiff, yes. a tall animal, lots of muscles, yeah. and something like um, a chihuahua. Small, scrawny. skinny. And, and small. <laughs> but you never had something like a, a bulldog, short and strong. Yes. Or a greyhound, tall and thin. Yes. But if those genes are next to each other on a chromosome, if a recombination event happens at some time in the future, you can get maybe a tall, thin gene or a short, muscular gene together in the same animal. So in other words, just the way the genes combine with one another, we get yeah. a new variation from it. We can rearrange the genes on a chromosome and get new combinations over time. Okay. And that can lead to new phenotypes, new adaptive abilities. All of a sudden, a species can go places where none of the individuals could be before because it's a new trait, it's a new ability. Mm -hmm. And that can be hidden, not in the same way as a recessive trait, but hidden as a potential. God okay. put those genes together on purpose, knowing that at some future time, recombination can happen, rearrange the genes, and boom, we have new phenotypes. Oh, change over time. Hmm. Because God, the engineer, programmed the potential for that change early on. All right. That's another interesting one. Here's the third one. Well, retro transposal. Yeah, retro That's another long word. Yeah. yeah, Joel and I, when we were working on this, we realized we're going to spend half the time defining things. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so so what's, what's that? Yeah. A retro transposon is a piece of DNA yes. that can pop out of the genome and make a circle and go somewhere else and stick somewhere else in the genome. And this is designed. They're designed. A lot of them have gene promoters in them. What's so that? 
it, it's the place where all the stuff in the cell attaches to before it slides down the DNA to make a protein. Okay. And if you take away that attachment point, the protein can't be made. Oh, okay. So the presence of the transposon turns a gene on or turns a gene off. Mm. And over time, as these things are popping around in the genome, they can literally turn things on, turn things off in an inheritable manner. So you can get, again, new phenotypes, new abilities, new behaviors, simply because these things are popping around in the genome and changing the organism. And it's designed to do it that way. And they're designed to do that. Okay, there's something interesting when I was reading your article on this topic. And if you haven't read the article, I invite you to, to read that article that we have here on the screen. But you mentioned something about we retrotransposons that no new information is created, yet we have a new phenotype. These things are already in existence. Okay. And if they move around, their sequence is the same. They might leave a scar behind if they leave, but you know, that, that's irrelevant. They move around. They're already coded to do what they do. It would be like um, you have a recipe book. Yes. And you have an ingredient list and you can shuffle around some of the ingredients, maybe double the number of chocolate chips or take the chocolate chips out and replace them with peanut butter chips. Okay. And that's what we're talking about. You have brand new, you know, like a double chocolate chip cookie or a peanut butter cookie or, a, you know, just a no chip at all cookie is the same basic recipe. Uh-huh. But if you change the ingredients, you get a totally new style. Oh, okay. And that's what we're talking about with these transposons jumping around producing new gene combinations and new gene turned on and turned off patterns which affect the organism. Wow. So we have so, really covered a lot of concepts today, yeah, but there's have. one very big one. What's that? So earlier on in the talk, we mentioned how God did not create just two of every created kind. He created yes, many kinds. This one, yes. And this leads us to our next one, gene gain and gene loss. What is that? Imagine that um, God creates... I don't know, a gazillion E. coli. Yes. Well, every E. coli, it turns out, mm -hmm. doesn't have the same genome. Really? So why? Because if you're a bacteria and you're living in an environment where there's another bacteria producing something that you need. Yes. Well, what happens if your gene for that gets deleted? Hmm. It doesn't matter because you can absorb it from the outside. So what you're saying is that bacteria, same E. coli, but because different populations... Yes. They have different genes in there. Yes. And so we have this concept we now call a pan genome. What's that? No. It's all the genes with an E. coli. A specific bacterium might not have all those genes. In fact, it probably does not have all those genes. What's, what's the list here? I always forget the numbers. 4.6 million letters in the traditional standard E. coli genome that mm -hmm. goes for 4,288 proteins. Yes. Except there are 5,500 known genes in E. coli. Okay, and so when one needs something that another one's missing, they're able to yeah, they can they can recombine, the they can sh share genes. the The meta population of E. coli has a lot more genes than any specific bacterium has. So we call it a pan genome. It's very similar to a baronome concept. The baronome or the pan genome of E. coli contains a lot of genes. So as they're growing over time, mm -hmm. as they're because they, uh, e. coli share DNA. Yes. As they're doing that, you have different D uh, DNA combinations and different bacteria, and you can get a bacterium that God did not initially create. Yes. That has genes, a combination of genes that were not in the initial creation. Mm -hmm. And yet, now that organism exists, and it maybe can go over into a different lake or grow a smaller population or a larger population or eat a food that, that no E. coli could eat before. Ah, yeah, so they can adapt a new e ecological niche, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. So change over time, uh -huh. adaptation, yes. brand new phenotypes, mm -hmm. that's all part of the creation model because it was engineered that way from the beginning. Wow, that changes everything again. I hope so. So everyone, I hope you enjoyed this uh, latest episode of Creation Talk. We have more that's coming up to talk about God's created diversity. We'll be looking at mutations. We'll be looking at... Um, epigenetics and the four-dimensional DNA. This is fascinating. So uh, if you enjoyed this, follow us on our channel and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye.